Today's training is over functional behavior assessments, specifically going through a case study example. This is task list item B3. It should be noted that this training program is based on the RBT task list and is designed to meet the 40 hour training requirement for RBT certification. The program is offered independent of the BACB. In this PowerPoint, we will be reviewing the functional behavior assessment of a fake client named Jane. We will first review background information about the client. Then we will discuss her indirect observations, direct observations, and functional analysis. Throughout, we will discuss results of these assessments as well as hypotheses for behavior. After discussing and viewing the functional analysis, we will analyze the results obtained. Finally, we will show you the references for this PowerPoint. We are now going to start by doing a review of the client. The client we will be reviewing is named Jane. Jane is a four-year-old child who lives with her parents. Her history includes that she has never received ABA services before, so both her and her parents are new to this process, and she recently has received a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. We are now going to go over the indirect observation assessment used with this client. First, we will start by doing a quick review of indirect observations. An indirect observation involves gathering data regarding behaviors, skills, deficits, and so on about the client. You gain this information by asking caregivers, teachers, or even the client themselves about their history. This is often in the form of questionnaires, surveys, rating scales, or interviews with someone who is familiar with the client. For Jane, we have both an interview with mom and results of a fast rating scale that her parents completed. Hi, Mrs. Carey. Hi, yeah. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. My name is Emily. I'll be uh, James BCBA. Okay. Um, is it okay if I refer to you as Mrs. Carey or is you, there a preferred You can call name? me Liz. That's okay, fine. perfect. Um, so I'll be providing supervision for her, but she is going to have technicians that are kind of doing that one on one direct therapy with her, but I'll be around kind of supervising them and um, making changes as needed. Uh, so before we kind of jump into all the details, I'd love to just get to know about Jane and your guys' family. So tell me um, anything. So. Um, so it's just me, my wife, and Jane at home. Um, Jane's four. She does have, I mean, obviously she has autism. Mm -hmm. You already know that. Um, but we've never done anything like this before, so I'm not really sure like, what type of information you want from her, I guess. Um, so are you mainly home with Jane, or is your wife? Um, I stay home most of the time. My wife okay. goes to work. Okay, perfect. So, um, do you have any other family members that might be coming and caring for her, or is it just you, you and Jane hanging out? Um, sometimes Grandma comes over and you know takes her off her hands for a couple of hours, but that's about it. Perfect. <clears throat> Emily, the BCBA, found out some important background information regarding Jane. For starters, we learned that she has an official diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. Additionally, we discovered that she is not receiving any ABA or related services. As for Jane's home life, we discovered that she lives with both parents. One mother has a full-time job while her other mother stays at home to take care of her. Additionally, Jane's grandmother comes over sometimes to help out. Having information regarding who spends a lot of time with Jane can help us direct parent and caregiver training in the future. We will most likely be communicating more frequently with Jane's mother who stays home with her, as this is the parent who has the most interactions with Jane.
Okay. So what do you you and Jane like to do? What are maybe some of her favorite things? Um, she really loves uh, looking at books and playing with uh, blocks and Legos. Oh, fun. Um, watching cartoons. Ooh, any favorite shows? She likes Mickey Mouse a lot. That's a good one. Um, Paw Patrol. Oh, perfect. And then, um, so those are her, some of her favorite things. What about foods? Does she like a lot of foods? Yeah, she she's not super picky. She's, I'd say she eats like typical four-year-old. She won't mm -hmm. really eat her vegetables, but you do. Um, I. So that's <laughs> she likes <clears throat> like pizza, chicken nuggets, um, pasta. Okay, very good. In this portion of the interview, we found out some more information regarding Jane's preferences. For starters, we found out that some of the tangibles she enjoys playing with are books, blocks, Legos, Mickey Mouse videos, and Paw Patrol videos. In addition to tangibles, we also discovered that Jane has some edibles that she enjoys eating, including pizza, pasta, and chicken nuggets. Her mother reported that she is not a picky eater. Having this information can help us plan for preference assessments in the future, pair with Jane, and plan for intervention methods. How does she kind of communicate with you? Um, she does a lot of pointing. She kind of like grabs my hand and like, you know, shows me what she wants or walks me to a location for something. Usually I can kind of figure out what she's trying to get. Okay. And is, does she ever get a little upset when she can't, you can't really figure out what she wants? Hmm, no, not really. Um, usually, like, she can just point. She's, she's very persistent, so oh. she, if she, like, points and drags me over with enough persistence, it's usually easy for me to figure it out. That's really good. That's good to see how persistent she is. In this portion of the interview, we found out some information regarding Jane's communication methods. We primarily found out that Jane tends to communicate by pointing to things or pulling people towards things slash leading people towards desired items. Knowing this can help us determine what communication method we can teach in the future to help replace Jane's inappropriate behaviors. All right, so let's kind of get into these problem behaviors. It sounds like you guys are having a little bit of a rough time right now. Um, can you tell me yeah. about that? Um, the biggest thing I'm concerned about, uh, she tends to like hit herself a lot. Okay. She kind of like punches herself in the head. Okay, so the head. Is it ever maybe some other body parts? No, not usually. It's pretty much just the head or the face. Okay. Um, has she ever hit you <clears throat> or your wife? Um. Only like a few times. Okay. Yeah, she's not really aggressive towards us very often. Okay. And then can you kind of tell me what that might look like? Um, so is it maybe with her hands or is it she's hitting her head against something else? It's with her hands. Um, sometimes it's like a fist, but like if she has something in her hand, like a toy, she'll use the toy to do it. In this portion of the interview, we were able to define what the problem behavior that is most concerning to Jane's parent is. We discovered that it is head hitting. Emily asked questions to determine in what way Jane is engaging in this behavior. We found out that she is doing so in the form of a closed fist or with items that she is holding at the time. We also discovered that this behavior happens frequently. Because of this, this is a behavior that we would be interested in assessing and intervening on. So when she hits herself, what usually happens right before that? Um, I don't know, usually she's kind of like just chilling in like the living room maybe. Um, I don't really know what happens right before every time because sometimes I'm like making dinner or like doing laundry or something and I kind of have her like 
in the room so she can play on her own so I can get some work done. Um, and then usually I can hear her like crying and that's when I go in and I can see that she's hitting herself. Okay, that makes sense. So she hits herself and then you come in. Um, what usually happens? So you come in and do what? Um, I usually uh, try and like stop it so she's not hitting herself mm -hmm. anymore. Um, she's usually crying and really upset so I try to give her some hugs and like tell her everything's okay and mm -hmm. uh, just kind of calm her down. Okay. And when she hits herself, um, about how hard is it? Does she ever leave bruises, welts, things like that? Um, she's had, I mean, she's had a, like, a little bump on her head a few times from it, but I, I can't really tell if it, if it hurts her or not. She mm -hmm. doesn't stop by herself, so. Okay. Have you ever had to maybe go to the emergency room or first for hitting herself? No, we talked to the doctor about it, and he said there's no signs of any, like, serious injury, but that it could happen if it keeps, you know, happening like this. In this section of the interview, we found out some information regarding the antecedents and consequences of Jane's head-hitting behavior. Some antecedents that the mother listed include when Jane is alone in a room or when a parent is unable to attend to her or is busy with other activities. Some consequences Jane has to her behavior include the parent coming to where Jane is, the parent blocking head hitting, and the parent hugging Jane and verbally reassuring her. All right, so now let's talk about some different scenarios. So let's say Jane's playing with her favorite Mickey Mouse toy um, and you had to, for whatever reason, take that toy away. Would she hit herself in that instance? Um, she doesn't usually hit herself. She does get really mad. I can tell that it, it frustrates her um, to have to give the toys up, but usually she'll just kind of cry and um, I kind of, as soon as like, she's as soon as, I'm, as soon as I'm able to give the toy back to her, then I just give it back so she stops okay. crying soon. So she can kind of wait that duration until she gets the toy back? Yeah, it's, it's not super long usually. Mm -hmm. Like. She gets to have the toys when she's like in the car rides and um, yeah, helps kind of mediate yeah. that. Okay, good to know. Um, what about if you guys are maybe at the grocery <coughs> store and there's a toy that um, she tries to grab and you tell her no, would that maybe cause her to hit herself? I've seen it maybe like a few times, but not normally. Okay, good to know. Um, I try to do the grocery shopping when she's with grandma, so. I understand that, <laughs> definitely. And then what about, so it sounds like most of the time it's usually when you might be having to get some stuff done at home, so she might be like by herself. Yeah, I think usually. so, yeah. Okay. In this section of the interview, Emily, the BCBA, asked further questions about other possible functions of the head-hitting behavior. The mother reported that the behavior of interest is not likely to occur when a toy is removed. She said when a toy is removed, other problem behaviors such as crying may occur. When this does happen, the toy is typically given back to the child. The mother also reported that the behavior of interest sometimes occurs if the child is denied access to a preferred item. The mom also mentioned that she is unable to take Jane with her on day-to-day -day activities, such as grocery shopping. If being able to take Jane with her is an important goal for mom, it is something that we can address through our intervention planning. We always want to keep the parents' goals and wants in mind. Therefore, it is important to note things like this whether a parent mentions something that they would like to work on or see improve. From this interview, we would hypothesize that Jane engages in SIB when she is not receiving attention from adults and when she is alone in a room. Now we will discuss the results of Jane's FAST assessment. This is a questionnaire that Jane's mother was asked to complete. On this first section, Jane's mother discussed general information related to her relationship with Jane. 
She indicated that she is Jane's parent and has known Jane for her entire life. She also indicated that she interacts with Jane daily in the form of mealtime, leisure time, and self-care routines. The next section of the FAST questionnaire involves information regarding problem behaviors. Jane's mother indicated that she engages in self-injury. She explained that it is in the form of Jane hitting or slapping herself. When asked about frequency and severity, Jane's mother reported that it occurred daily and was severe to the point where it could result in significant harm to Jane or others. When asked when the behavior is most likely to occur, Jane's mother reported that it occurs whenever Jane is home, specifically when she is in the living room. She also reported that Jane engages in this behavior when she is alone. When asked when the behavior is least likely to occur, Jane's mother reported that it rarely occurs when she or her wife is interacting with Jane. Alike to previous answers, Jane's mother also reported that Jane is alone when the problem behavior occurs, so she is unsure of what happens directly before most of the time. The consequence that Jane's mother reported was that her or her wife run into the room to check on Jane when they hear her engaging in this behavior. Finally, her mother reported that she is currently not receiving any treatments. The following sections discuss situations in which the problem behaviors are likely to occur. This highlighted section is used to assess whether the behavior is maintained by socials in the form of attention or preferred items. This highlighted section is used to assess whether the behavior is maintained by escape from demands and activities. This highlighted section is used to assess whether Jane's SIB is maintained by automatic reinforcement in the form of sensory stimulation. And finally, the last section is used to determine whether Jane is engaging in the behavior to receive automatic reinforcement in the form of pain reduction. The final section of the FAST questionnaire focuses on how to score the recently discussed questions. As you can see, the functions are all listed to the right-hand side, and the questions that correspond to those functions are listed on the left side. To score this report, you will circle the questions that the parent responded yes to, and then add up how many yeses each function has. The function that has the highest amount of yeses is likely to be the function that is maintaining the problem behavior. For the social attention or preferred items category, we can see that Jane's mother circled yes for all items. She reported that Jane engaged in problem behavior when no one was paying attention to her, when a request for an item was denied, and when a preferred item or activity was removed. She also reported that when the behavior does occur, she or others step in to provide attention and engage with Jane. According to this report, Jane is unlikely to engage in these behaviors when she is receiving a lot of attention. As for scoring, the scorer would circle one through four and write the score four, on the line that corresponds to the social function. For the social escape from tasks or activities, Jane's mother responded yes to one question. Her mother reported that she is not likely to engage in problem behavior when asked to do something. However, she did circle yes for the question regarding if the client is unlikely to engage in problem behavior during times when they are not required to do anything specific. Because of this, the scorer would circle question 8 on the scoring section and write a number 1 on the line.
For the automatic sensory stimulation section, Jane's mother circled yes for three out of four questions. She reported that Jane engages in the target behavior when she is alone and when activities are available to her. She also reported that Jane is less likely to engage in the behavior if other self-stimulatory activities are present. However, she indicated that Jane's behavior does not appear to be self-stimulatory. Because of these answers, the scorer would circle questions 9, 10, and 12 and write a 3 on the line that corresponds with sensory stimulation. Finally, the last section refers to automatic stimulation in the form of reducing pain. Jane's mother circled yes to one out of four questions. She indicated that Jane is likely to engage in the behavior if she is ill. However, she also reported that Jane does not have patterns regarding the behavior, does not have recurring situations that cause pain, and that her problem behavior does not decrease after receiving medical treatment. Because of these answers, the scorer would circle question 15 and report a one on the line. Jane received a four on the attention scale for the questionnaire and a three for the automatic sensory stimulation portion. Because of this, the scorer would hypothesize that these are possible functions of Jane's SIB. We will now discuss the direct observation methods used to assess Jane's behavior. We are now going to discuss the direct observation conducted with Jane. As a review, a direct observation is when you directly observe behavior without manipulating variables or the environment. This means that the person who is observing tries their best to avoid disrupting the environment or causing a change in behavior. They focus solely on taking data, which is often in the form of ABC continuous data, which is when there are predetermined antecedents behaviors and consequences listed. Therefore, the observer just circles the antecedents, behaviors, and consequences as they occur. ABC narrative is when the observer writes open-ended notes for the antecedents, behaviors, and consequences that they observe. And finally, scatterplot data is when the observer records data pertaining to what times of the day the client engages in the target behaviors. The individual who observed Jane completed ABC narrative data. This slide depicts some of the ABC data that the observer took while observing Jane. The highlighted sections show that the observer consistently saw that Jane was hitting herself with a closed or opened fist. The portions that are highlighted yellow represent instances in which Jane's behavior appeared to be maintained by access to tangibles. If you look at the antecedents, Jane often engaged in the target behavior when the technician said, my turn, when the technician tried to transition to a less preferred area, and when another child reached for her toy. As for consequences, Jane often gained additional access to preferred items as the technician either waited and allowed more time to play, or the child who went near Jane's toys left the area immediately after Jane began engaging in the problem behavior. The portions that are highlighted blue represent instances in which Jane's behavior appeared to be maintained by attention. 
In instances where the technician had to walk away or attend to other activities, Jane engaged in SIB. Afterwards, the technician attended to her in the form of reprimands or walking towards her. As you can see in the bottom right, Jane even attempted to climb into the technician's lap once they returned from another activity. The hypotheses that are gained from the ABC data analysis are that Jane engages in these behaviors to gain access to tangibles and to attention. We will now go over the final assessment used to assess Jane's behavior, and this was a functional analysis. The final part of the functional behavior assessment is to conduct a functional analysis. As a review, a functional analysis involves testing hypotheses by manipulating the client's environment. The hypotheses that we have gathered from Jane's indirect and direct observations is that she engages in head hitting to gain access to attention for automatic stimulation and to gain access to tangibles. Before conducting the FA, we will operationally define Jane's behavior so that it is clear what behaviors will and will not be reinforced throughout the FA. The operational definition for Jane's head hitting is any instance in which Jane uses an open or closed fist to make forceful contact with her head and or face. The FA conditions that we will run are contingent attention. This means that we will withhold attention unless Jane engages in head hitting. Contingent is access to tangibles. This means that we will remove tangibles unless or until Jane engages in head hitting. In a loan condition, which is when we remove access to attention and tangibles to test whether the behavior is maintained by automatic stimulation. And finally, we will have a control condition where we provide access to tangibles and attention. If Jane engages in the target response, the technician will not change any of their behavior in response to Jane's behavior. We plan to run each condition three times for 10 minutes each. We will only be showing you a portion of each session. Two. <gasps> <laughs> Oh my goodness! The fours. Yay! Dog, 
two dog, three dog. Oh, it's a coat. sharing. Work though, you can play with your toys. Here, here you 
go. Glasses, look at all these toys. Play with those. I have to do work. You okay? What's going on? Here. Here you go. I'll be right back. We will now go over the results and possible future directions for intervention based on the FA. This graph depicts the results of the three sessions for the FA. As you can see, the control and alone condition involved little to no problem behavior. This means that Jane's behavior is unlikely to be maintained by automatic reinforcement. Additionally, the conditions in which Jane received access to preferred items or access to attention, Jane engaged in higher rates of problem behavior. This means that it is likely that Jane's behavior is maintained by attention and access to tangibles. One method would be to implement a differential reinforcement procedure in which the technician teaches a communication response. This may involve Jane exchanging an icon or using another communication method to mand for attention or tangibles. As for the problem behavior, the technician could either ignore it by continuing to remove items or to continue ignoring the client. But because Jane's SIB is severe, it may be a better option to provide minimal attention in the form of blocking the SIB and or prompting the client to their communication system. By blocking Jane's behavior, we can ensure that she is safe. The following is a summary review where we will go over some questions regarding FBAs. The following is a question that you should write down in your homework packet. Which of the following is an umbrella term for the assessment methods used to determine the function of someone's behavior? A. Functional analysis B. Functional behavior assessment C, indirect observation, or D, direct observation? I'll give you guys a moment to review these answers and determine which one of these is the umbrella term.
The correct answer is B, functional behavior assessment. Functional behavior assessment is an umbrella term used to describe the three mentioned assessment techniques. The first is indirect observation, the next is descriptive or direct observation, and the last one is functional analysis. This is another question that you should write down in your homework packet. If the individual engages in high rates of behavior while in the alone condition, the behavior is likely to be maintained by A, attention, B, boredom, C, automatic reinforcement, or D, access to reinforcers. I'll give you guys a moment to review these answers. The correct answer is C, automatic reinforcement. In the alone condition, there is no access to tangibles or access to attention or others. Because of this, it is likely that the individual will engage in a self-stimulatory behavior. If the target behavior, which in Jane's case was head hitting, was maintained by sensory stimulation, the individual would engage in it at high rates while alone with no access to other distractions. Please make sure to write the following question in your homework packet. When implementing a behavior reduction protocol, it is important to include, and you should be selecting all that apply, A, a behavior reduction method, B, punishment, C, a skill acquisition method, or D, extinction. I'll give you guys a moment to select the answers that apply to this question. A critical component of behavior reduction procedures is to have both a method to decrease behavior and a method to increase another more appropriate replacement behavior. The purpose of FBAs is to determine the function of the target behavior. This information allows us to use the function to choose and teach a replacement behavior. For example, Jane's head hitting behavior could be replaced by a more appropriate behavior such as manding with icons. If Jane is taught to communicate that she would like attention or a specific tangible, she can begin engaging in more appropriate responses to gain this access. It is important to note that the replacement behavior should always be less effortful than the problem behavior. Handing over one icon is less effortful than hitting yourself several times on the head. Additionally, the replacement behavior should be one that is likely to be reinforced by others while in other environments. Jane's parents should be trained on icon exchange communication so that they can reinforce this behavior while at home. This is the last question that we will have you write down in your homework packet. The question goes as follows. FBAs are important because A, allows technician experience working with different problem behaviors, B, could be cool for interns to see, C, it's on the RBT task list, or D, it leads to effective interventions. I'll give you guys a moment to review these answers. The correct answer is D, effective interventions. 
As mentioned before, FBAs help us identify what the function of the behavior is. Therefore, when we are intervention planning, we are focused on the true function of the behavior rather than just focusing on behavior reduction. Because we focus on the function of the behavior to select replacement behaviors, interventions tend to be more effective and successful. Research has shown that interventions based on the results of an FBA tend to lead to changes in behavior that last over time and lead to interventions that are based in positive reinforcement. By using socially acceptable and ethical procedures such as positive reinforcement to make lasting changes in someone's life, we are doing our job as behavior analysts.